Oscar Wilde once said, responsibility is what we expect from somebody else. This is very true. Most people dread accepting responsibility. That's just a fact of life, and we can see it in operation every day. We can see ourselves getting hot under the collar when the dentist keeps us waiting, and we're sitting there reading old magazines when our appointment was 30 minutes ago. And we don't stop to think that we forgot to mail in this month's mortgage payment. We can see ourselves growing angrier and angrier because a business contact is supposed to call at noon, and here it is almost two o'clock, and the phone still refuses to ring. But we don't stop to think about the calls we ourselves have forgotten to return while we've been so busy fuming. We can see ourselves writing an angry letter to the airline because a flight was delayed, but we don't write an angry letter to ourselves when we're late for something, even though that might not be a bad idea at all. Yes, we can see avoidance of responsibility all the time in both our personal and professional lives. And here's something else we can see just as often. We can see that most people aren't as successful as they wish they were. Do you see there's a connection between these two very common phenomena? I certainly do. I hope you'll understand that it's in your best interests to take responsibility for everything you do. But that's only the beginning. I'm also going to suggest that many times it's even best to accept responsibility for the mistakes of others, especially when you're in a managerial or leadership role. I can hear you saying, what? Accept responsibility for someone else's mess-ups? Why would I want to do something like that? Well, that's a fair enough question, and over the next few minutes, I'll try to answer it. During the years when professional basketball was just beginning to become really popular, Bill Russell, who played center for the Boston Celtics, was one of the greatest players in the pro league. He was especially known for his rebounding and his defensive skills. But like a lot of very tall centers, Russell was never much of a free-throw shooter. His free-throw percentage was quite a bit below average, in fact. But this low percentage didn't really give a clear picture of Russell's ability as an athlete. And in one game, he gave a very convincing demonstration of this. It was the final game of a championship series between Boston and the Los Angeles Lakers. With about 12 seconds left to play, the Lakers were behind by one point, and Boston had the ball. It was obvious that the Lakers would have to foul one of Boston's players in order to get the ball back. And they chose to foul Bill Russell. This was a perfectly logical choice, since statistically... Russell was the worst free-throw shooter on the court at that moment. If he missed the shot, the Lakers would probably get the ball back, and they'd still have enough time to try to win the game. But if Russell made his first free-throw, the Lakers' chances would be seriously diminished, and if he made both shots, the game would essentially be over. Bill Russell had a very peculiar style of shooting free-throws. Today, no self-respecting basketball player anywhere in America would attempt it. Aside from the question of whether it's an effective way to shoot a basket, it just looked too ridiculous. Whenever he had to shoot a free throw, the six foot eleven Russell would start off holding the ball in both hands about waist high. Then he'd squat down, and as he straightened up, he'd let go of the ball. It looked like he was trying to throw a bucket of dirt over a wall. But regardless of how he looked, as soon as Bill Russell was fouled, he knew the Celtics were going to win the game. He was absolutely certain of it. Because in a situation like this, statistics and percentages mean nothing. There was a much more important factor at work, something that no one has found a way to express in numbers and decimal points. Simply put, Bill Russell was a player who wanted to take responsibility for the success or failure of his team. He wanted the weight on his shoulders in a situation like this. No possibility for excuses 
No possibility of blaming anyone else if the game was lost. No second guessing. Bill Russell wanted the ball in his own hands and nobody else's. And like magic, even if he'd missed every free throw he'd ever shot in his life before this, he knew he was going to make this one. And that is exactly what happened. That is what virtually always happens when a man or woman accepts responsibility eagerly and with confidence. I've always felt that accepting responsibility is one of the highest forms of human maturity, a willingness to be accountable. To put yourself on the line is really the defining characteristic of adulthood. Anyone who has raised children knows how true this is. Just look at a baby during the first few years of life. Every gesture, every facial expression, every tentative word has one message for the baby's parents. The message is, I am totally dependent on you. I can't do anything for myself even if I try. I can't be held responsible for the consequences. After all, I'm just a baby. Ten or twelve years later, of course, as the boy or girl enters adolescence, this message to the parents will be very different. It will sound something like this. Why don't you just leave me alone? I want to be totally independent. I don't want to do anything but think about myself. I certainly don't want to accept any responsibility for anything beyond my own very well-defined needs and desires. It's only when we're at last grown up that the first two messages, I'm totally dependent on you and I'm totally independent of you, finally turn into you can depend on me, which is the truly adult outlook. Strange as it may seem, of course, there are people in their 30s and 40s who are still acting like adolescents, and there are even people in their 40s and 50s who are still acting like babies as far as their attitude toward responsibility is concerned. These kinds of people can be hard to have around, especially if you have to work with them. But the large number of people who shirk responsibility can also provide opportunities for you if you are determined to be different. If you decide to be one of the few who embraces responsibility, you can lead, and you will deserve to lead. Churchill said, Responsibility is the price of greatness. And in my opinion, it's really a rather small price to pay. Let me be more specific about exactly what is involved in becoming a responsible person. It means, first of all, that you accept the consequences of your actions. But I'll go even further than that. Responsibility means you look to yourself as the source of everything that happens to you. It means that you assume command, regardless of the hardships you may have undergone early in life, or the prejudice you may have encountered, or the dozens of people who may have failed to understand you. Do you detect a note of irony in my voice, or perhaps a note of sarcasm? Do I sound hard-hearted? Do I seem to be denying the existence of difficult childhoods, or of prejudice, or of people who are insensitive to the needs of others? Well, that is certainly not my intention, nor is it my belief. I'm saying that regardless of the presence of those negative influences in your life, the best thing you can do, the most empowering thing, the strongest thing, and ultimately the wisest thing, is to accept responsibility for your own destiny, plain and simple. The benefits of this approach to life have been proven in some pretty dramatic ways. People who have been afflicted by serious illness, for example, appear to have a better chance of recovery if they decide to take responsibility for what has happened to them, despite the fact that it would be easier and perhaps even more reasonable to simply see themselves as victims of fate. There's a man, let's call him John, who had been healthy and vigorous all his life, who had started and sold businesses in a number of different fields before finally deciding to enter law school 
in his late 40s. At that time, however, he began to suffer some severe health problems. All his life, his main focus had been on success and achievement, and he really hadn't paid much attention to what was happening to his body. For years, John subsisted largely on a diet of donuts and black coffee. And because he traveled a great deal, he also consumed large amounts of airplane food. Inexorably, he was gaining weight, five pounds one year, 10 pounds the next year, 15 pounds the year after that. Of course, John responded by opening a number of stores that featured clothing for overweight men. And he even used himself in his advertisements. In retrospect, this was probably a mistake. It gave him an incentive to gain even more weight. One year, John gained 20 pounds and actually bragged about that fact in his newspaper ads. Then he was diagnosed with severe diabetes. Although John's physicians assured him that the disease was brought about as much by heredity as by behavioral patterns, he was the kind of man who believed that he was the captain of his own ship, not a common sailor taking orders from someone higher up. He was a man of strong character. And now in the face of this new challenge, John resolved to begin taking responsibility for his own well-being. As he explains it, all my adult life I've been preoccupied with supporting my family and getting ahead financially. It was a sense of responsibility that I felt, and to a large extent I've lived up to it. But I can see now that responsibility is beginning to express itself in a different way. Providing for my family is not just a matter of dollars and cents anymore. It's a matter of staying alive. It's my health. And it's the health of my family that's at stake as well. John continues, I'm not setting a good example for my kids. They've seen me gaining weight. They've seen me literally brag about it in my advertisements. And lately they've been gaining weight themselves. I think in some sense they believe this is what I want them to do, and maybe they're not completely wrong. In fact, I've been thinking of including my kids in some new advertisements, and depending upon how it goes over, I've had it in the back of my mind to open up some clothing stores for overweight youngsters. John's eyes begin to light up at the thought of expanding his business and cashing in on new opportunities, but then he caught himself. And as he continued to speak, he pounded his fist on the table. There I go again, he said. I've gotten myself locked into a certain kind of thinking. And now I've got to get myself out of it. It's as simple as that. It was clear that John had indeed gotten himself locked into some well-defined thought patterns. But the most important one was the way he saw himself as the cause of everything that happened, not only in his own life, but in the lives of others. The doctors had told him his diabetes might have come on even if he hadn't been overeating and overworking. But John knew that was nonsense. And as far as his kids were concerned, there have been a lot of news reports documenting the fact that American kids in general are heavier than they used to be, they just don't get the same amount of exercise as the children of previous generations. John could have resigned himself to the fact that his kids, like just about all kids today, are going to watch television, play video games, and eat junk food, whether he gained weight or not. But he didn't. Baloney, he said, it's all my fault, and I'm going to do something about it. In fact... I'm going to do a lot about it. And he did do a lot about it. John radically changed his diet and his lifestyle. He began ordering vegetarian meals on plane flights. He became a fitness enthusiast and ran several marathons. Although he ran rather slowly, as you might expect of a man in his fifties, he took pride in the fact that he always ran the course three times on the day before the race, on the official race day, and again on the day after. 
Instead of opening a clothing store for overweight children and using his own kids in the advertisements, he consulted a behavioral psychologist who helped him devise a system of financial rewards for his children that helped motivate them to bring their weight down a system that taught them something about money at the same time. John is now in significantly better physical shape, is entering his final year of law school, and is negotiating with several companies to market his behavioral science techniques for reversing juvenile obesity. Sooner or later, all of us face situations in which we must decide whether to accept responsibility for a problem or look for ways to avoid responsibility. Assuming that you have, in fact, done something that has caused a problem of some kind, let's look at the various options and decisions that are now open to you. First, there's the role played by intention. In other words, was the outcome of your action what you intended it to be? And if it was not, should you still accept responsibility for that outcome? This is a very serious issue in the way we think about responsibility in our society. In many areas of criminal law, for instance, the intention to commit a crime must be present in order for the accused to be held criminally responsible. This intention is something quite different from mere negligence. If you leave your garden hose lying across the sidewalk so that the mailman trips over it and breaks his leg, you may be held responsible in a civil suit, but you would not be prosecuted as a criminal in the way you would be, for instance, if you had used a weapon in a robbery or an assault. But we don't have to enter a courtroom to see the important role intention plays in accepting responsibility ourselves or assigning it to others. Don't you remember when you were a kid and you left the screen door open so that the cat ran outside and was lost all afternoon? What did you say to avoid responsibility? You said, I didn't mean to do that. You said, it was an accident. As I pointed out earlier, there are lots of people who still use these childlike rationalizations well into their middle age. But if and when you decide you want to be an adult, you begin to see the whole question of intention as nothing more than another opportunity for excuse-making, and you should refuse to participate in it. The great thing about excuses, and the really dangerous thing about them, is that no matter what happens, excuses are always there waiting to be used. Anybody can have an excuse for absolutely anything, and people have never been better at it than they are today. But the downside of excuses, even good ones, is that nobody really believes them. I don't care what people tell you. If you make excuses, they're going to know it, and they're going to think less of you. But if you refuse to rely on excuses, people are going to know that too, and they'll admire you for it. This is especially true in business. One of the classic examples happened about 15 years ago. A widely advertised health care product from a leading manufacturer was shown to be unsafe. And the company responded by pulling every single box off the shelves at a cost of millions of dollars. Was the company destroyed? Hardly. If they had done anything else, there would have been a tremendous loss of confidence both on the part of consumers and employees. Instead, there was honest acceptance of responsibility for a mistake, and the public image of the company was dramatically enhanced. Contrast this with what happened recently to a leading manufacturer of computer chips. When a new microprocessor didn't perform up to expectations, the company made excuses. It was a minor problem, something that would crop up once in a lifetime, and so forth. Were these excuses valid? Maybe. Maybe not. But it doesn't really matter, does it? So many people use excuses, but nobody really buys them. It's our modern version of the fable about the boy who cried wolf. In this case, the computer chip manufacturer finally took so much heat 
that they did replace the processors, which is what they should have done in the first place. An offshoot of the I didn't mean to do it excuse for evading responsibility is the I wasn't myself at the time excuse. This really deserves to be a category all its own, particularly since it's received so much attention in the courts, where it often occurs in the form of a defense based on temporary insanity or some other stress-related syndrome. A friend tells me about one day when she flew up from Texas to Los Angeles for a joint presentation that she'd be making along with a fellow from New York City. They had planned it all out, very carefully over the phone. A lot of documents had been assembled. But they both knew that what really counts in face-to-face -face meetings is personal impression. On this score, my friend felt very confident about the L.A. meeting because her guy from New York City was an extremely charismatic personality. A burly and bearded man, always ready with a joke, he never wore a business suit, and his trademark outfit was a plaid shirt worn with the sleeves rolled up, a loosely knotted knit tie, khaki slacks, and loafers. His favorite expression was, let's get the show on the road, and he always said it with such gusto that he sounded like a 19th century wagon master starting a wagon train up the Oregon Trail. Most of all, he could sell refrigerators to the Eskimos. And of course, it was all because he was so good at selling himself. You can imagine my friend's extreme surprise and deep disappointment when this usually energetic ball of fire completely dropped the ball in their presentation. When they met in the client's outer office, my friend could hardly believe what she was seeing. The guy from New York was just sitting there, almost like a lump. He had no energy left whatsoever, like every bit of vitality had been drained out of him. When the meeting actually got underway, he seemed to grow even more lethargic, while my friend was left trying to pick up the slack. She was puzzled and could see also the incomprehension on the faces of the people she'd traveled all this way to meet. Here was this big guy in a plaid shirt, all but slumped over like the mouse at Alice in Wonderland's tea party. Was anybody going to invest money in that man's ideas? He seemed about as dynamic as a sack of potatoes. As you might expect, it wasn't long before they were safely outside the building, and my friend wasted no time in asking what in the world was wrong. In response, this usually energetic man in his lumberjack shirt said something about jet lag. It was all because of jet lag, he explained. He just wasn't himself. The flight from New York had been just too much. He'd feel better in a day or so, but for the time being, he was just not the man he normally was. He just wasn't himself. Well, it was all she could do to keep from laughing in his face. Here was a guy who looked like a wagon master leading settlers across the continent, and he was put totally out of commission by a first-class flight from New York City. What could she say? Jet lag? Is that the problem, she asked? Is that all? Well, not exactly, he replied. There is something else. Now she grew more concerned. Obviously, there was something deeply worrying this man. It could be anything. Maybe he'd been diagnosed with a serious illness, or perhaps someone in his family was ill. Maybe his house had burned down. Maybe he was in serious financial trouble. It's okay, she said, trying to sound calm for her own benefit as well as for her colleague. Do you want to talk about it? He nodded. It's sad. Well, I'm sure it is, but I'm also sure you'll be able to handle it. For the first time all day, he smiled a weak little smile. No, he said, you don't understand. SAD is an acronym for Seasonal Affective Disorder. As my friend listened with amazement, he went on to explain that his jet lag had been worsened by the effects of seasonal affective disorder, a mood disorder brought on by the short, chilly days of winter. 
You're out here in the West, where it doesn't really get all that cold, he concluded, sounding totally miserable. You don't really know what it's like. Of course my friend knew what it's like. We all know what it's like. And what it's like is excuses, evasion of responsibility, acting like a child, refusing to grow up. You can call it jet lag or sad or whatever you want, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. My friend wanted to tell him what she really thought of his psycho babble, but she knew what the class move really was here, and she wanted to make the class move because she wanted to be a strong character. And remember, a strong character assumes responsibility. If you want to be a leader, you must choose to assume responsibility for whatever happens, whether you have to or not. It's like being at the helm of a ship. You are responsible for everything that takes place on your watch. Don't worry about it, she said. I should have been ready to carry the meeting by myself. Next time, I'll be better prepared. Then she caught a cab back to the airport. Let me elaborate a bit further on the relationship between responsibility and leadership. Bear Bryant once said something about this issue. Bryant, of course, was the coach of many great football teams at the University of Alabama. And until his record was broken recently, he had the highest number of victories of any coach in the history of the game. Bryant said that from his point of view, it was impossible for any of his players to make a mistake during a football game. Any and all mistakes were his, because as coach he was solely and completely responsible for preparing his athletes to play error-free football. By saying this, Bryant was truly accepting a leadership role, and he was embracing the special category of responsibility that comes with it. As a leader, you've got to own responsibility for preparing subordinates for the challenges they'll face, and if the result is not successful, you've got to accept responsibility for not having prepared them adequately. Maybe this seems like a harsh standard to live up to, but that's just the way it is. If you can't handle responsibility and leadership, at least admit it to yourself and don't let other people start depending on you. Choose the standard you want to live by and follow through on. In the ancient world, during the time of the Roman Empire, there was an interesting attitude toward this kind of choice-making. It was a brutal world in those days, to say the least. Anything could happen, from plagues to revolutions to barbarian invasions. Even for the upper classes, it was a challenge just to survive. Yet certain people attempted to do more. There was a tradition whereby people attempted to create themselves and their characters exactly the way an artist would create a painting or a sculpture. And like a work of art, these people looked upon their lives and their characters as things of beauty that would live on after their deaths in the memories of their friends and families. People who chose to live their lives this way were not monks or ascetics or in any way removed from life in the everyday world. They were just very serious about building strong character. In fact, the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius was a famous example of this type of person, and his journal is a powerful example of everything that's involved in building character and leadership. Much of it was written in military camps while the emperor was leading the Roman armies against barbarian tribes in what is now Germany. The writings of this ancient emperor and of the other people from the same period reflect a conscious choice to live according to certain standards of responsibility and character. This kind of clear decision about how to build your inner self is something that we rarely see today. Most people want to be good. They want to be ethical and moral and successful in every way. They want to fulfill their potential, but they think it's something that will just happen itself. They don't see that there should be a conscious, ongoing acceptance of responsibility for what you do and who you really are. 
There's an old saying that goes, I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and saw that life was duty. If you want to be really in control of your life, and if you want other people to be able to depend on you and look to you for leadership, you must wake up from the dream that somebody else will handle the pressure, that somebody else will shoot those two free throws. I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and saw that life was duty. Accepting responsibility doesn't mean that life can't be beautiful, but it does mean opening your eyes to the realities a successful person not only must accept, but eagerly desires to accept. It means making a conscious decision to grow up, to let go of the dependency needs of childhood and adolescence, and recreate yourself as somebody other people can depend on. It means wanting the ball when the game is on the line. 